She's so determined she could tie a devil to a cushion. The poor man's trying to carry sunlight in a basket. You have to bend to make your way in the world. The early 17th century artist Peter Bruegel the Younger worked in Antwerp, now in modern day Belgium, but then a thriving centre of commerce and art in the Spanish Netherlands. He ran a highly successful workshop that brilliantly encouraged and met the demand for his paintings. One of the finest of these is the barber's complex and compelling two peasants binding firewood from around 1610. Peasants and Proverbs features no less than three other versions of this comical, yet also somewhat sinister painting, reflecting the widespread and enduring popularity of the composition. It explores how Bruegel and his studio reproduced and exploited prototypes inherited from his more famous father, Peter Bruegel the Elder. In searching for the meaning and message of this enigmatic little painting, the exhibition also considers the fascinating tradition of Netherlandish proverbs and their extraordinary representation in the visual arts. The expert authority behind the exhibition and catalogue co-author is Dr. Jamie Edwards of the University of Exeter. This exhibition is all about a particular painting by Peter Brogel the Younger called Two Peasants Binding Firewood. And what we're really trying to do is to shine a spotlight on the artist and then we're also trying to uncover what the painting is really supposed to be about. So who are the people and what are they supposed to be doing um, and what were they really supposed to mean for an early 17th century viewer. And he was an enormously successful artist. So he oversaw a very large and very productive shop um, out of which over a thousand paintings um, came and were released onto the market. Um, around 1400 have been catalogued and attributed to him and the shop. So it was an enormously productive enterprise. And alongside all of that, we know that he had a reputation for being a very good painter. So there's lots of evidence that tells us he was held in high esteem and was respected by his contemporaries. And those contemporaries include the famous artist Anthony van Dyck, who included Peter Bruegel the Younger in his iconography, which is a series of portraits of the great and the good in the Netherlands in the early 17th century. He produces many, many different types of pictures. So like his father, he produces religious works, but he also concentrated to some extent on images of everyday life and everyday people, including peasants. And he shows peasants in the countryside. Sometimes they're working, other times they're celebrating, and other times they're up to no good. So it's a real diversity that we see in his output. And his success was based to a very large extent on the fame and reputation of his father. So Peter Bruegel the Elder was very, very famous in his own lifetime, and he died prematurely. And when he died, he starved the art market of new original paintings. And it was that demand that Bruegel the Younger satisfied with his workshop and his output. The fascination with peasants um, really is a difficult one to explain. Um, lots of debate exists in the literature on why peasants became such a popular theme in the middle of the 16th century. Um, but I think there are lots of possible answers. And one answer is that people were beginning to recognise that the peasant could be seen as an emblem of the Netherlands. You know, the peasant becomes a representative of Netherlandish life and culture which people thought had gone unchanged for centuries. Um, in the 17th century, you might say that everything becomes a little less highbrow. Uh, Peter Brebel the Younger is making these pictures on an industrial scale, and he's working perhaps for less discerning clients. But nevertheless, there is still a connection between these images and the images of his father, which really came out of a sophisticated circle, and a sophisticated circle that was interested in debating Netherlandish history in which the peasant uh, played a key role. He was a very skillful artist, so when you look at the paintings that are attributed directly to him, they are often very high quality. So he had a thorough grounding in oil painting, he knew how to produce high quality works that presumably fetched a good price on the art market, and he did this um, with a particular sophistication. So he did this very well and was very accomplished as a painter in oil. So to copy the works of Peter Bruegel the Elder, you have to have a particular set of skills. You have to be able to prepare panels properly, to produce underdrawings, and then to actually execute them using oil paint. 
And the thing about Peter Bregel the Younger is that he was able to do this so successfully because he must have inherited a great deal of material from his father. So he was the firstborn son of the elder Bregel, and with that means he must have inherited um, certainly drawings, but also possibly paintings. And that provided the capacity to be able to replicate his father's paintings in the 17th century. He copied his father's works to a very large extent and a great deal of his output was really focused on reproducing famous compositions by the elder Bruegel. And he was doing that for the very simple reason that you couldn't get paintings by Peter Bruegel the Elder on the art market. So he'd been very famous during his own lifetime, he made very famous and influential paintings and it was that demand for those images that Peter Bruegel the Younger satisfied with his very large output. But when it comes to original invention, you might say that he was a less accomplished artist. And when he does invent compositions, you might say that he was less successful as an artist in comparison to his father. But I don't think that should mean that we view him as a second-rate artist. You know, all the evidence suggests that he was held in very high esteem. There are 12 or so versions of Two Peasants Mining Firewood, so it was obviously a very popular composition. And if we want to make sense of that, I think we need to recognise that it's almost certainly the case that the composition derives from a now lost original work by Peter Bruegel the Elder, and that could have been a drawing or a painting that Bruegel the Younger had at his disposal. Or it might have been a composition by Martin van Cleef, who was a great contemporary of Peter Bruegel the Elder. Two Peasants Mining Firewood is always described as an enigmatic painting but I actually think it's relatively easy to figure out what's going on. And I think that the answer is that we have two peasants who are up to no good, and they've been caught in the act of stealing firewood. And in that sense, the painting is a comic subversion of the well-established tradition for showing virtuous labouring peasants who are often shown um, bundling firewood in representations of winter. So it relates to an established image, an established type, in Netherlandish art, but it relates to it in a subversive way and it produces a comic picture that is about misbehaving peasants who are stealing firewood. At a time we need to remember when firewood was an expensive commodity. The painting provides lots of clues that we are dealing with misbehaving peasants um, rather than virtuous ones. We can look for example at costume, we can also think about the meaning of the contrast between large and lean, but we can also think about specific motifs in the painting, and some of these relate to proverbs which we can identify and which help us to tell a fuller story about this painting and its meanings. So for example, the lean peasant on the right who is shabbily dressed, um, his head is bandaged in a funny way, um, his head is wrapped um, around the forehead and his ears and his jaw, um, and that bandage relates to a specific proverb, to have toothache behind the ear, which meant to be a malingerer or a deceiver. Um, that same figure has a very prominent codpiece, which also tells us something about him and his character. And the codpiece at this period really was a sign of immorality and particularly of lust. Um, that same figure has also dropped a flute, and that flute also has many connections with proverbs and the flute always stands as a symbol of deceit and immorality. The, the figures in the painting have a comic appearance. So the larger figure on the left has a jolly, comical face, and he looks startled, which is quite amusing, and that fits with the reading of the painting, that these two have been caught in the act, whereas the figure on the right is dressed in a very stereotypical fashion for an itinerant vagabond peasant. So this is someone that has a rootless existence, goes from place to place, and in those different places is usually shown getting up to no good. The figure on the right um, is shown as if he's speaking out of the side of his mouth. And the idea there is that he's telling his companion that they've been caught, and he's basically saying to him, you know, the game's up. Proverbs became a really popular subject in the 16th century. So in the early 16th century, many writers began to compile and edit and translate proverbs, often proverbs from antiquity, and the books they wrote about proverbs became some of the century's best sellers. And a key figure there was Erasmus of Rotterdam, 
who spent enormous amounts of time compiling proverbs and translating them and explaining them, and his books on proverbs in the end address literally thousands of proverbs and their meanings. And it's for that reason that the period is often described as the golden age of the proverb. And it sort of follows that artists um, got in on the act as well. If it's so popular in literature, then it could become a popular subject in painting as well. And again, a real pioneer there was Peter Bruegel the Elder, who produces many paintings of proverbs, sometimes of individual proverbs, but also entire compendia of proverbs. And this continued then into the 17th century with his son, but also others, who still recognised that there was a market interest in the proverb. These paintings uh, were so successful, I think, because they are so appealing. So proverbs are often very visual in their language, so it makes sense that artists wanted to convert them into visual images. And what you end up with are intriguing paintings that are often funny to look at. And I think the way that they worked originally is that they're paintings that you're supposed to stand in front of um, with a group of people and you discuss the proverbs, you try to identify what's what and you try to identify the meanings and applications of those proverbs. And the real upshot for artists, I think, when you do this sort of thing is that you end up with very engaging pictures that force you to look at them for a very long time and they're not at all preachy but nevertheless you still gain something from them that might have a benefit in the conduct of life.